It's good to see you out on this beautiful, crisp fall morning. We're progressing into the greatest time of the year, and so we're excited about that. I'd like you, if you would, invite you to take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 4. D James chapter 4. This, this chapter is kind of loosely connected to what we've already talked about in James chapter 3, as we will see. And it's really all about the cause and the cure of, of interpersonal conflicts. And so this is a, a big deal as we have talked about this worldly wisdom that can affect the way that we interact with one another. We've talked about the tongue and how it can become a very poisonous tool and, and destroy um, people in their lives and, and whatnot. And, and, and just understanding this wisdom from above has to really capture our hearts and guide and direct us so that we can live and have relationships that are healthy and balanced. And, and that's what we want to see. And I've told you about my job that I had uh, when uh, we were getting ready to go to the mission field. We were living in Pennsylvania. I was working at a place called Conestoga Wood in East Earl, Pennsylvania. That's very nice. Um, and we were living there. And I worked at this place called Conestoga Wood. And I was the boxer of cabinets. It was a great job, peace work, the whole deal. You could keep making raises if you met uh, your rate and whatnot, and they had the rates really low, and, and I was very motivated to uh, make more money to provide. And when I first started working there, it was, it was uh, difficult because of rates uh, and my requirement to box so many cabinets. I was dependent upon those that were called the pickers. Those were the guys that went through the various places in the warehouse and picked the various pieces of this RTA or ready-to-assemble cabinetry. And so they would have to go and they would have to pick those pieces and fill those orders and then bring them to me and then I would place them in the box, secure the pieces so that they didn't get damaged, box them up, stack them on a skid so that they could be loaded into a truck and delivered to their customers. So as a person who was trying to uh, box more cabinets so that I could meet my piece rate, so that I could up my my pay, as so to speak, I was very much concerned about how quickly the other guys did their job. They were not on piece rate. They were just standard hourly wage type people. And so here I am trying to box very fast to get more cabinets done, and they're going through. Now, there was one guy, his name was Longley, and Longley was very quick. I loved Longley. He was always getting the, the, the orders filled, getting them to me quickly. And I thought, this guy, he gets it, man. He understands. He's my buddy, until I realized what Longley was doing. You see, Longley had this idea. It was all about him. And so what he would do is he would get into the aisle and he would sit right there in the middle of the aisle and pull his pieces and nobody else was able to get around him. Nobody else was able to do their job until Longley was done in that aisle because he would block the way because it was all about Longley. We redesigned the warehouse and I began to realize the other guys were just as fast, if not faster, once there was no traffic blocking their way, blocking their goals. And when we become very self-focused, that's exactly what happens. We, we only think about ourselves. We only do things that matter to ourselves. And therefore, we can get whatever we want done, but the rest of the world is miserable around us. And that's what James is going to talk about here in our interpersonal relationships and the conflict. And so when you read this passage of Scripture and you see what James says and the strong language that he uses, you could come away with the idea, well, <laughs> James is going a little bit overboard. He's going over the top when he's suggesting that hatred and anger and, and the discord between individuals is equated with murder. But James actually does say that. And so, you know, the fact of the matter is, you might say, well, that's just, that's, that's a little extreme. Because, after all, isn't conflict within and without the church just a normal part of our human experience? Well, the answer to that is yes, 
Conflict within our relationships is a normal part of our experiences, especially when our lives are governed from wisdom below. That's the bottom line of what James has been saying throughout this section. But the more important question, the question that we should be asking ourselves, especially as a church, is whether it has to be the normal. Does this have to be the norm, this, this conflict? And the answer to that question is an emphatic, no, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't. The answer to that question is this emphatic no, as James is going to share with us. We can, in fact, have a different experience than the norm of what we've expected. When we are governed by wisdom that is from above. Now, a crucial step in this journey to understand is to understand how God views what we have become, we have come to accept as the normal and the all too prevalent experience within the local church of interpersonal conflict. Now here's what I want you to understand. Here's what we have to do. This is a crucial step. We need to understand that the stark contrast, the stark contrast between life governed by wisdom from above and one governed by the world, or the worldliness, as he calls it here in this passage, or the wisdom from below, cannot be overstated when understood from God's perspective. God did not create us to live in disharmony. God did not create the church to be divided. God created the church to enjoy the relationships that, that he intends us to enjoy now, that's not to say there aren't going to be those conflicts. They are, but how we handle that is important. And understanding that when we operate from wisdom from above, the experience that we can have is far, far different than when, it's, when, it's operating, when we are operating on wisdom from below. Now, the next critical step that, that James is going to pull us through here to rid ourselves of this thinking that har living in harmony is, just sounds too good to be true and that things can't really be different. It's normal for there to be this disharmony. The, the next step we have to do is we have to come to grips with the understanding of what God is going to say to us here in James chapter 4. And, and we've got to rid ourselves of this thinking that we can't expect everybody to get along in church, can we? Well, yes, we can. We can't expect that the church fights and splits can become rare occurrences, can we? Well, the answer is yes, we can. And the remedy for all these dysfunctional relationships that we have experienced or maybe even this time experiencing is, is found in here in James chapter 4 as he examines the source and the cause for all of this disruption. Actually, as we've suggested, he's already laid the foundation for this in chapter 3 and now in chapter 4. And he's already laid this foundation as he says here, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, that we have a cure for the causes that bring about this place. Here's, here's, the, here's the big picture of what James is trying to say here in this chapter, verses 1 through 12 that we look at here this morning. Disharmony in our relationships is a direct result of worldly wisdom coupled with the destructive tongue, which he talks about in chapter 3. The disharmony in our relation is a direct result. So that when we feel that, one or both of the parties that are in conflict are experiencing wisdom or utilizing wisdom that is from above. There's no escaping that. This principle is reinforced throughout Scripture over and over again. If we walk in the Spirit, we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh, the passions and the desires of the flesh. And he's going to talk about that here as well. So here's some very early teaching in the, in the church experience on what brings about disharmony. It's, it's a direct result of the worldly wisdom coupled with a destructive tongue when our tongue speaks from our heart, which is governed by worldly wisdom. So let's just pause here and read verses 1 through 12 and take a look at the, the cause and the cure. He talks about the, the cause 
in verses 1 through 3. And then he condemns that cause in verses 4, 5, and 6. And then verse 7 down through 12, he presents to us the cure or the way to remedy all of this. Listen to what James says here in chapter 4, verse 1. Here's what he says. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? Your passions are at war within you. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you, ha- and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace, therefore it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and, and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he shall exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against his a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and the judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Therefore, is only one, there, I said, there is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Well, let's pray and ask God's blessing on his word this morning. Father, we thank you for this very important passage of Scripture where you talk about how we can have harmony within our relationships, and in particular in relationships within the church. God, we we recognize that it's all too normal for those relationships to be strained at times and, and to be made difficult. And our histories of the church, they're, they're just filled with, with splits and divides and, and broken relationships. And, and this doesn't honor you. It's, it's evidence of uh, lives lived by wisdom from below, not wisdom above. And so we pray that you would use your word here this morning, that you would give us understanding of, of what your truth is saying to us, so that we might live out that truth in a way that honors and pleases you and enjoy the harmony that you desire to have as our experience within our relationships. We pray that you would lead and guide and be glorified in all that is said as we study your word here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, let's first and foremost look at the analysis that James gives us here concerning conflict as he analyzes it. And he starts off with a question. James likes to do that. He likes to pose a question and, and he wants to ask the question, what causes the conflict? What, what's, the, what's the original source of these conflicts that you experience? And then he provides an answer. The, the, the question is found in the first part of verse 1 and then the answer goes from the latter part of verse 1 all the way through verse 3. Here's what it says. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Now, there are those who would look at the book of James and say that James is written primarily to unbelievers. 
We have not taken that approach. We believe that James is writing to believers who have been scattered because of the persecution. And so therefore James is writing about groups of, uh, or writing to groups of believers that have gathered together wherever they've scattered. And he's saying what is causing these fights and these turmoils among you? He addresses them as brothers later on. And so we see he's, I think in particular, he's talking to primarily to believers. So he's asking, what is causing this disharmony amongst the believing brethren that have gathered together? Why is this happening? And so that's his penetrating question that he asks here. He answers it for us in the, the latter part of verse 1 all the way down through verse 3. Generally, he gives the answer as this. Is, is that we are adulterous people. He, he, he says that in, in chapter uh, 4, verse 4. He says, you adulterous people. Spiritual adultery is what he's talking about. You have left me and you followed after your passions. Your passions have become your lover, so to speak. Okay, and so as we, as we look at this, he says, it is not this that it is your passions, the latter part of verse 1, you are, that are at war within you. You are allowing your passions to drive you rather than your relationship with God and His Word. And so, generally speaking here, he's just saying, you are an adulterous people. You have, you have cheated on me as your God. You have chosen to reject me, to not follow me, and to follow your passions. That's what it really means to live from wisdom from below rather than wisdom from above. When we live by wisdom from above, we are looking to God as our Savior, the sovereign Lord over us, which he's going to talk about in the latter part of chapter 4, of living our life underneath his sovereign control. But to, to live from above is meaning that we look up to him for his guidance and his direction, for the directions for how we are to live our life. When we don't do that, he uses very strong language here, you are committing spiritual adultery against me, your God. Now, there's no escaping that James uses some very strong language here. But basically what he says in verses 2 and 3 is he describes those who are at, at war with one another. He says there's, there's this pursuit of self-interest uh, self and then there is spiritual manipulation going on. Look at verse 2. He says, you desire and you do not have, so you murder. Now, I don't think that uh, James is necessarily saying there's actual murders going on. I, it's possible, I guess. Um, but I think what he's talking about here is the same thing that Jesus talked about, is to hate your brother is to commit murder. It's the same idea. And so we look at it as, well, it's, you know, it's, eh, yeah, it's just, it's not a big deal. But in God's, from God's perspective, it is a big deal. When there's disharmony amongst the believer... There is, that is a big deal to God. That's something God does not want. It's not something that God desires at all, but it's all too common because we are operating under a different set of directives, our directives, our passions, as he says in chapter 4, verse 1. And so we have to recognize there's this pursuit of self-interest, he says. He says, you desire and you do not have, and so therefore you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. And you do not have because you do not ask. And then he talks about the spiritual manipulation here. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And here's what he's basically saying. You're going to God and seeking Him in prayer asking him for things that will fill your passion bucket, so to speak. You, you desire to see God give you what you want to fulfill your passions and your desires rather than seeking what God wants and how God wants you to live. There's the problem. Where does this come from? Because if we become so self-focused, it's about our interests, not the interest of others. It's about what we want, not what, what God wants or what others need. It's all about me, me, me. 
And therefore, we go to God and we say, what's the matter with prayer? It's not working. And God's saying, you don't have, even though you ask, because you ask for the wrong motivations. You ask to fulfill your passions, your selfish desires, rather than God's. That's the bottom line. And so when we see the disruption that takes place in our relationships within the church or within our everyday lives, there's, there's one or two things happening here. Either there's somebody else who is living according to the worldly wisdom, or you are living according to worldly living, or both of you are. And when both of you are, it is really destructive. The disharmony is evident, and it's hard to escape, and it's hard to even live in because it is so hard and destructive. That's what James is trying to say here. When you see this, this is what's going on. So here's what we need to understand as we look at these first three verses as James analyzes the whole conflict. When we are guided by self-interest and worldly wisdom and faced with conflict, here's the thing. Here's what will happen. We will turn on our fellow man rather than turning to God. That's why conflicts happen. When, when we're faced with conflict and we're operating based on are me-centric, what I want, what, how I feel, right, and using worldly wisdom, when we're faced with conflict, we're going to turn on one another rather than turning to God. So when you go back again, we've said it before, James reflects a lot of what Jesus' teachings were, especially in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. You're going to see that same idea reflected in Jesus' teaching. That if, 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 we are, if we're operating according to the world and we are oper operating by our own self-centeredness, then conflict is inevitable and we will turn on one another rather than turn to God in dependence. We will seek our rights. We will seek our things. We will want it our way rather than surrendering to God and saying, God, you're in control. You can deal with this situation. We take matters into our own hands and we try to seek revenge rather than letting God get it. We try to seek the solution rather than seeking God's wisdom and how to do it. We figure out our way and we do it our way. And that's destructive. It, 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 it's just wrong for us to pursue life in that manner. So when we're guided by our self-centeredness and worldly wisdom, when, we, when the conflict comes, we're going to turn on each other rather than turn to God in dependence. And so as he identifies this and he explains it, this is where it comes from. Now he brings a condemnation of it, verses 4, 5, and 6. Listen to this. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so here, James, he states, he states the reality. When you are living according to the self-centered, worldly wisdom way. When you're living that way, it's spiritual adultery. You have walked away from God. You have disowned Him in a sense, and you have chosen your own way. You are cheating on your relationship with God rather than living in submission to Him. Now, when we get to this section, there's a probably the most difficult verse to translate or to interpret in particular is verse 5. And it has been debated down through the years. What is exactly is he referring to? Look at verse 5. After saying that this is spiritual adultery, verse 5 reads this way. Or do you suppose it is no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns je jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us? 
Now, the first problem is that if you go look for a scripture passage that specifically says what it's being said here, you're not going to have, you're not going to find that specific verse. Well, you'll find a combination of verses that will portray this idea, but you're not going to find a specific group or a specific passage of scripture. And so, what you have to understand is that what what is, who is the he here? Who is the personal pronouns? Which is very difficult. Who is the he that yearns jealously over the spirit? Who is the spirit? Is it our spirit? Is it the Holy Spirit? That, because it would indicate something like that, that has, he has made to dwell in us. But then you also have man's spirit, which is that life-giving spirit that God gives to all man. Kind, okay, is it, is it our man spirit, our human spirit, or is it the Holy Spirit? Which one is it? And who is this that jealously yearns over it? And, and the key question, again, is who is the audience? If he's talking to the unbeliever, then that might drive us in one direction. If he's talking to the believer, as I'm suggesting, it drives you in a dri different direction. But there's, there's basically three interpretive possibilities here for us to, to consider. And the first one is, is that what is being talked about here in verse 5 is that God yearns for your spirit to be totally surrendered to Him. Now you can go through Scripture and you can see that. There's, there's no doubt about that that, that, that God yearns for us to give of our lives in complete surrender to Him. Then there's another one. It's, it's referring to our human spirit yearns enviously for worldly pleasures. And you can find scripture that will indicate that that's true. As a matter of fact, the context here would, would suggest that that is, what's go, that that is what's going on. Is that there's our human passions are driving us to be fulfilled. But then there's another interpretation which is the Holy Spirit, the he refers to the, or the spirit refers to the Holy Spirit within us and longs for this total loyalty. Now, as I said, there's, there's good scholarship on all sides. It's, it's hard to know uh, which one to go with here. The interpretation is, is shows up in your various um, your translations. They show differently and, and, and based on how they interpret this. It's really hard to figure out where to go with it. There's no doubt about that. But here's what you need to understand. There is, as difficult as the interpretation may be, there's a clear point that's being made in verses 4, 5, and 6. Now, I, I take the position that it's number 3 here, that the Holy Spirit within us, because I do believe He's speaking to, spirit, uh, to, to Christians, I do believe He's talking about the Holy Spirit that resides within the believer, that yearns and longs for. We just went through a series on the Holy Spirit not too long ago where we talked about how we can grieve the Holy Spirit or we can quench the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit's lot, role in our life is very important to bring conviction to our lives and to enlighten us onto the direction that God wants us to live. And when we, when we push that away or when we quench that or we somehow squelch it and its role in our life, then there, there's a grieving of the Spirit that takes place. And so I, I, I think it's number three. It could be just as easily number one. Some might say, hey, it's, it's talking about our human spirit. As a matter of fact, the ESV, which translation I'm using in, doesn't capitalize spirit, and so it's taking it to mean the human spirit. And so you can go either way, but here's the clear point that is made in verses 4, 5, and 6. This kind of thinking, this, whether it be your, God yearning for your spirit to be totally surrendered to Him, and it's not, or whether it be the Holy Spirit within us that longs for our total surrender, and we don't, or whether it's our human spirit that yearns and longs for the things of this world and the passions of the pleasures of this world, rather than God, it is enemy, it's an enmity with God. It's an opposition to God. When our spirit is not totally yielded to Him, when our lives are not completely surrendered to Him, that means that we are in an re adversarial relationship with God. It matters, it's a big deal. 
That's what James is trying to get across. We can't just act like it's no big deal. It is a big deal. So when our relationships within the church are breaking down, we just don't, well, you know, that's just the way it is. Just human nature. No. For the believer, that is counter to what God has called us to. And we are to live and surrender to Him. And therefore, it matters. And so when our relationships are breaking down and we're operating under the worldly wisdom rather than the godly wisdom that God provides, then we are at enmity. We are in an adversarial relationship with God. We are working against Him rather than with Him. And it, it also shows that, that there's apathy towards the, 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 towards the Word of God. And look, at he, he talks about this, this accusation against our, our, our sin nature. God's Word makes it very clear. This is not the way it's supposed to be. And when we allow it to continue to exist, we're saying, well, you know, I know what God says, but it's not a big deal. You know, it's just kind of normal. No, it's not. And it's, it's, it's contrary to the instruction that has been given us concerning our sin nature. Look at verse 6 in particular here. He says this, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud who say, I'm going to live it my way rather than God's way. God resists those. He opposes those, but he gives grace to the humble. So therefore, submit yourselves to God. Here's what James is saying. James is basically trying to help us understand that this is not normal for the believer. It's normal for the sin nature. It's normal for the unbeliever, but it's not to be normal for us. And we need to understand that God opposes us when we live in worldly wisdom rather than godly wisdom. When we are living on the wisdom that is from above, yes, there's going to be a struggle. Yes, there's going to be those times when we have conflict. But here's what we are to do, humble ourselves. And that's where James really wants to move in this next section. So here's what we have to understand. We can try and justify our self-centeredness and the worldly wisdom all we want. But God views it as spiritual adultery. This is why the New Testament is very clear that when there's sin in the church, it needs to be dealt with. It's not to be overlooked. This is why when there's sin in your own personal life, Matthew chapter 18, you're to deal with that, not to overlook it. Why? Because anything less than that is spiritual adultery. Anything less than seeking harmony and peace within the body is viewed by God as being disloyal to Him rebellious towards him in an, putting ourselves in an adversarial relationship with him and we can excuse it all we want to and say well that's just the way it is no it's not supposed to be that way and the issue isn't whether sin's going to show up in our lives it's going to show up in our lives the issue is what do we do when it happens and that's why James moves now to the cure what do we do what do we do when we find ourselves at odds with one another? How do we function? How do we move forward? How do we get to the harmony again in those relationships? And that's what James talks about in verses 7 down through verse 12. The correction for the conflict that goes on. And it's stated very clearly there in verse 7. We just read it. Submit yourselves Therefore, to God. That's the big umbrella statement. Because you see, everything that he's talked about from verse 1 down through verse 6 is really all about living my life in a self-centered way or the way that I think it needs to be lived. It, it, it's living life according to worldly wisdom rather than godly wisdom. So verses 1 through 6, that's what it's been about. He's been calling us out. He's condemned it. He's talked about this is what causes all the friction and the division that's among us. And he says this is not the way it's supposed to be. So what do we do? What are we supposed to do? First and foremost, big umbrella picture. Submit to God. That's where it starts. Submit to God. Now he, he goes on to explain this 
from an inward perspective. In other words, what does it mean to submit to God inwardly? And then he talks about it, what it means like to submit to God outwardly. So he, he, he explains it. He expands this idea. But the big picture here, here's the bottom line. If I want to live in harmony, then I need to bring myself under submission to God. I need to operate on his wisdom, not mine. My wisdom is going to get me into trouble. His wisdom will guide me through it. Okay? That's the big umbrella picture here. Now, look at how he talks about inwardly what we need to do. Verse, the latter part of verse 7 down through verse 10. He gives you four stage steps or so to speak. Four specific things that we need to do inwardly within our inner man. This is what we need to do. First and foremost, resist the devil. Now, he hasn't gone into a lot about this, the demonic or the satanic aspect of this, but he's alluded to it a number of times already. He's talked about that the worldly wisdom is demonic. It's of the devil. He's talked about that. And so the first thing we need to understand is that when there is spiritual conflict going on in our relationships, there, it's really a spiritual war that's taking place. Satan seeks to divide us in our homes and in our church and our individual relationships. And so when we're in conflict, there's a spiritual war going on. When I deal with couples in premarital counseling and even in counseling, I, all, I all often will take them to, to uh, Ephesians. So turn with me, if you will, there to Ephesians chapter 6 and this great passage where he talks about uh, putting on the whole armor of God. And I want you to think about it in, sense of, in the context of, of uh, relationships and the difficulties of relationships. Here's what it says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, and put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Why? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Our problem is not each other. We wrestle against rulers and against authorities and against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heaven. There's three you laws that are here. You are in a war. You have an adversary. And your adversary is not each other. It's a spiritual war. And so we have to resist the devil. Because what does the devil want to whisper in our ears? You deserve your rights to be met. You deserve whatever you think you want. If they're in the way, you need to move them out of the way. It's not about them, it's about you. That's what the devil does. And so here's where Paul, or James starts. If you're going to submit to God, you've got to resist the devil. Second thing that he talks about, draw near to God. This is a beautiful picture of repentance because repentance isn't just saying, oh, I'm sorry. Repentance isn't just saying, oh, I, I, I feel bad that I got caught. Repentance is going in a direction that is towards sin and turning it around and heading in the opposite direction. That's repentance. What he's talking about here is resist the devil and draw near to God. Change course. Don't listen to this. Listen to him. That's what he's talking about here. Draw near to God. Look at verse 8. He says this. He says, he says draw near to God. And here's the promise, and he will draw near to you. And then he talks about dealing with our inner attitudes and the sins that are within ourselves. That's where it always starts, because I have to, I have to deal with me before I can even begin. Jesus talked about it as the log, deal with the log that's in your eye before you deal with the splinter in your brother's eye. So we have to deal with ourselves. Look at what he says here in uh, the, this verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched or, and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Repent over your sin. Deal with those inner attitudes, those, those the things that you can control. I can't control the other person, but I can surely deal with my own sin issues. My own anger, my own resentment, my own desire for vengeance or revenge. I can deal with those things. I can't deal with the other person. I can't fix them. But I can definitely deal with me. 
And so we are to resist the devil, draw near to God, he will draw near to us, and we are to repent of the inner attitudes and the, the, the ways in which we are operating under worldly wisdom rather than godly wisdom. And then verse 10, he brings it back again to this idea that we are to humble ourselves. So you have this sandwich of sorts. Submit to God, resist the devil, draw near to him, repent of your sin, humble yourself, get over yourself. You see, self-centeredness is all about doing it me and me, me, me. Doing it God's way is submitting to God and humbling myself before him. That's what he talks about. Then he talks about, verses 11 and 12, some of those outward things that we need to do. Is what does it mean to submit to God? And he just brings us some summary statements that he's already talked about in chapter 3, chapter 2, chapter 1. But here's what he says in verse 11. He says, Do not speak evil against your brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but you're a judge. Now, James is talking primarily to a Jewish audience, so they get this idea. If you are the one who's judging based on the law, then you are not a doer of it. You are a judge of it. And there is only one who does that, and that's God. And so James is speaking to a Jewish audience, which would you understand. Guard what you say and guard against this judgmentalism that can creep in. You are not the one who is to make the final judgment on these things. You are not the one who, who, who is in charge. God is. And this is inappropriate for us to set ourselves up as, as judge. It's inappropriate in light of who God is. He is the judge. And it's inappropriate in light of who the other people that we find ourselves in conflict with. Look at what he says here. He says, there is only one lawgiver and judge, he, he who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? We have to be on guard with what we say. And, and our attitude of mind that we can come across as arrogant or superior. We're going to see that later on here in this chapter. But the reality here for us is to understand that conflict is the devil's playground. And therefore, we need God's mind and heart to navigate it successfully. Conflict is the devil's playground. Now, I want you to understand conflict is is good and it is allowed by God because it's what brings us back to this position he talks about. Submit to him, humble yourself. Resist the devil, draw near to him. Cleanse your own heart and humble yourself before God. That's what God wants. That's why God allows conflict to come into our way, to drive us to the point where we recognize we are operating under worldly wisdom rather than godly wisdom. I've told you about my experience in Bible college, my freshman year, where I was quite the rebellious one. You know, those preacher's kids and all that kind of stuff. My father was the president of the school, and there, at the time, he was the chairman of the pastoral theology department. And I told you about my view of Bible college. I considered it to be an overgrown Sunday school class, which I hated Sunday school. Now I teach it. But nonetheless, back then I, I, just, I just despised it. I just, I, I, no. And now to go to Bible college. Dad required that we would go at least one year. That one year was the most amazing year for many respects. It was the year where I saw myself for who I was. I saw God for who he was. And I humbled myself and placed myself underneath his authority and gave my life completely to him. Whether I got saved at that point or whether I was saved when I was seven, it doesn't matter because at that point in that, in that year of my Bible college, and actually it was in the first semester of my Bible college, it all culminated in one thing where I knew I was living contrary to the way God wanted me to live. I knew that I was living in rebellion to the rules that were placed over me by my father, my mother, and the school that I was going to. And I realized that I was not living as I should have lived. And I, I knew that there was something that was wrong, and so therefore, I had a choice. 
If I was going to continue to live like this, it was going to be a destructive path, and I knew it. Or I could surrender, give my life to the Lord, and find a different path that would follow him rather than me. I ran with a group of college students. We were all doing the same things. We were all breaking the same rules. We were all getting in trouble in the same ways. I was a little better than they were in the sense that I was sneakier and could get away with it easier. But nonetheless, we were all there. But the Lord brought me under extreme conviction when I brought myself and I realized I needed to deal with this sin in my heart. And I went to my resident assistant, my RA, who then went to the dean of men, who then went to the president, which ended up in me being suspended from Bible college with the threat, if you get in trouble one more time, you will be kicked out permanently from Bible college. It doesn't matter who your father is. And it was during that weekend of suspension where God got a hold of my life and I surrendered to him. Now that group of people that I was running with, they took a different path. They said, no way, no way am I doing that. As far as I know, there's not a single one of those young people that are following the Lord today. Because they chose to continue to operate according to the worldly wisdom. Now this is not a story to say, Ooh, look at John Talley. No, I'm a mess, you're a mess, we're all a mess. We've established that part. God wants to take that mess and he wants to make something beautiful out of it. And he's in the process of doing that in all of us. This isn't a story about that. This is a story that says... If you will humble yourself and submit to him, God will take you on a journey that will be a far different than those who do not. And when we see the relationships around us moving us in that direction, it's very difficult to break away from them, but it's what God calls us to do. And here's the question that we have to ask ourselves. Are we going to continue to live in arrogance? Or are we going to continue... To in a different direction, to live in submission and humbleness before God. I can testify to you that having made that choice in the fall of 1978, God has led me down a journey that I would not trade for anything. But as I've traveled down that journey, I've seen many others make a different choice and choose to live according to themselves and worldly wisdom. And it's destructive. God says that doesn't have to be that way. There is a different way. And that way is the way of submission and humility before him. It means repentance and cleansing of ourselves. Can't fix everybody else, but we can deal with us. Are you operating under worldly or godly wisdom? The evidence will be there for you to see. The question is, do you have enough humility to see it and to choose to follow him? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We recognize that we have a choice, a choice to follow you and to operate on your wisdom or a choice to operate on our own wisdom and our own self-interest and doing things our own way. Your word is very clear. That's destructive. It causes us to be in an adversarial role with you and with those around us. God, we pray that you will do a work in our hearts. And we will seek the, the way from above rather than the way from below. We'll be sure to give you the praise for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen.